Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had an encounter of your own and would like to speak with me whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. Tonight's guest is Casey Brennan. Casey, welcome to the show. How you doing, Vic? I'm doing great, and you? Great. Great. It's great having you here. Casey, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm uh, 33 years old, a father of three. I grew up and was raised in northwest Florida, and uh, that's probably where I'll be buried at. I uh, don't travel much, but to the woods or did at one time. And uh, unfortunately, that's all going to come to a slowdown, and I guess you just figure out why soon. Yeah, they will figure that out soon. Before you had your encounter, what kind of interest did you have in Sasquatch and other things like that that go bump in the night? I've always been interested, I guess, as much as anybody else. You watch the documentaries, you know, you hear stuff in the woods, you don't see it. It's always piquing your curiosity, but uh, after I've seen what I've seen, there's no doubt in my mind anymore. There's no question. Yeah, you know things like that are real now. There's no removing that. How much time did you spend in the woods before you had that encounter? I grew up in the woods, man. Back when we used to hunt and fish and go to the woods, this particular area that I grew up at, we cut bamboo, we took it to the fishing hole, we caught fish. I mean, it was that simple. Back before the fishing laws came in effect and you had to get a fishing license, I mean, that was our hobbies. We went to the bay and to the woods and hunted and fished, and, I mean, it was the norm. Grew up barefooted, running in the woods, never had a care in the world. Actually, why I'm living where I'm living, and I have my kids kind of in the country to be able to experience that type of life, to be able to enjoy it also. Well, it sounds like you know your way around the woods. You're not going to mistake a squirrel for a moose, so that goes without saying. Without telling us any of the details of your encounter, had you heard about anyone having a dogman encounter in the area where you had yours before you had your encounter? Well, it was everything from park rangers to other people. But what I found strange about this particular area is no one camped in tents except us. And it's a beautiful place. I mean, before this encounter, my idea was if you're camping in an RV, then you're just basically staying in a home that's there. You're not enjoying the the outdoors, everything it has to offer. But after my experience, yeah, that's a lot different. But, yeah, I've had park rangers tell me they've seen things and, and described them, everything from a panther to a bear. But the way it moved was definitely not either of them. Yeah, from the way you describe it, it sounds like it definitely wasn't. How did you find out about dogman encounters? Well, I had uh, went online to do as much research as I could because I knew I wasn't losing my mind. I had two other witnesses with me, one my father and one my wife. We had watched every episode of everything that is out from Google, the Internet, everything that you could find, which led to YouTube videos and people talking, and then I found your Dogman Encounter show, man. And really, to anyone that's ever had an experience that's really... I don't know to say traumatized, but it's definitely shocking, to say the least. It changes the way you view the outdoors. It changes the way a lot of things go if you live in the woods. So as a shout-out to you, Vic, I mean, if it's okay, I'd like to tell everybody to go to the Dogman Encounter app, download it, pay you two ninety nine a month, and it's almost as good as counseling. You can actually hear people that had encounters. You know, it's up to you whether you want to believe them. But if you've seen it and you know it's there, I definitely recommend doing it. There's no ads in it. You get from point A to point B. It's some relief. Also lets you know you're not alone. Well, thanks for the good words, and thanks for putting a plug in for the show on the app. Your dad came home one time rattled because of something that happened to him. Please tell us about that. Well, this was about 13 years ago, and my dad... Like every other dad, he hung the moon and was tougher than nails. You know, nothing ever rattled him. 
He had a campsite. It was about 35 miles deep in the woods. And back then, you went to the local courthouse and got a lease for a piece of land, and that's where your campsite was. So you could go there, camp. Whether it had a lake or a fishing hole was up to wherever you got. He had got the lease, and he was there about two months, and he had him a camper. So he's laying in his camper about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and he said he heard wolves in the background. Now, this area is deep in the woods. When I say deep, there's no roads but one getting in or out. And whatever the wolves were chasing was running toward him. He could hear the wolves echoing through the night closer and closer and closer to the point it woke him up. Well, he got up and he kind of had his ear to the window like anybody else would do. And he said he heard a scream that was unlike any scream he had ever heard. He described it to me in just the face alone that he makes makes you laugh, but also makes you believe it because he was terrified. He said he got up, threw a gallon of gas on the campfire that was almost out, lit up the whole area, got in his truck, and didn't come back until the next day. So that was his experience. I didn't take it to heart, you know. I grew up in outdoors also, and I didn't know if it was just a boogeyman tale or something. But when I had my experience, I kind of joined the club of, okay, I know what's up. Yeah, I'd say you do know what's up now. After having that experience, did your dad continue to do things in the woods like he used to, or did he stop going out? No, it was absolutely the words. I'm not going anywhere by myself. I'm not going fishing by myself. I'm not going camping by myself. And this is someone who was raised in the woods also that taught me everything I know. And I could plow a field. I could live off the land if I had to. But... He was scared, and he had good reason to be. If what I had seen was anything like he had heard, then he had every right to be. But no, he he changed up a lot of things. I mean, honestly, I think he went camping with me. He was with me when I had my encounter, but I think, you know, every time I went camping, he'd ask to go. And he would sleep in his own tent, but I think he went as just backup, to be honest with you because he knew inside his heart something's out there, and he didn't want his grandkids exposed to it. Well, the fact that he went with you says a lot about his character. Good man. Are there a lot of Sasquatch encounters in the area where your dad had that experience? This particular area is a road that's a good 75 miles long, and it's all national forest. Everybody claims to have seen skunk ape, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, whatever. But the stories are so thick that it's okay, whatever. It's just as normal as a cup of coffee. And the people you hear it from are oftentimes hillbillies or people that live in the country, so nobody pays them any attention. But whenever a judge or somebody of higher official sees something, it makes the news. It's just strange how it works. But yeah, most definitely, sightings galore. That part of Florida, it's got to be overrun with encounters like that. You were fishing one time at a pond when you had an unusual experience. Please tell us what happened. Well, we were uh, fishing, and the kids were swimming on the other side of it. And there's two places to fish on each side of the pond. Well, me being me, I had to beat a trail behind the pond to try to snag some bass, because if you're a fisherman, that's where they're hiding, just where you can't reach. I get over, and I'm starting to throw out, and I'm catching them, buddy, as fast as I can throw it in. So I end up breaking a tree limb, make a fish stringer, and drop it in the water. About five or ten minutes of me fishing, now when you're fishing, you're focused on your lure, your pole, nothing else. I just got this feeling that something was watching me. Something was watching me. I don't know how to describe it. Something was going to get me. And, uh, Anyway, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I look behind me, of course, like anybody else would do. I look over at the kids. They're playing, not having a care in the world. And uh, I pick my fish up and take my tail around there to where they're at and put my fishing equipment up for the day. Because, you know, everybody has that extra sense. And most definitely, this was the same pond that everything else was experienced at. So 
at the same place where the campsite was at where it happened. So I'm almost positive of what it was. So I put my fishing equipment up, walk around with my wife, and I tell her, I say, something's back there behind the pond, and they didn't think anything about it. And about 20 minutes later, not even that long, the sun starts to creep down, and it's not dark. It's not exactly the brightest out. And we look over and around the pond where the trails are is a doe, a female deer, and she has a fawn with her. And I was telling my kids, look, guys, there's a baby deer. You know, there's a deer, which they're thick out there, but they never tend to get that close to you. So I thought it was kind of a good moment for the kids to see them. As any other kid would do, and, and, and all the kids, they were jumping for joy and running as fast as they could close to the area. I said, slow down, you know, don't scare it away. And sure enough, she wasn't moving. Now, the baby was running to and from. It was running away from mom, but it would come right back. The baby sensed danger, but didn't leave its mother. So as we get closer walking around the pond, which is a right turn going to where it's at, the mama deer had actually walked across the walking path and laid down right beside it, and the baby deer followed. So we walked up on the mom deer, the doe, and it didn't move. So at this point, I'm probably 25 or 30 feet from it. I told the kids, I said, you got to stay back. Something's not right. Nothing's going to stay that close to you. So anyway, I walk up on the deer, and she stands up, and her left back leg is ripped completely off from the knee joint down. There's fresh blood squirting. Now, I see this, and at the same time I see this, I hear something on the opposite side of the trail tear off through the woods. I did not see anything. I did not look. I got my butt out of there, and I told my wife, I was like, let's go. I didn't really want my kids to see that. So we took off and went back up to the campsite. So we get back to the campsite, and it had been raining a little bit. I wouldn't even really call it a rain. I'd say more like a mist, enough to get everything soft and wet. We get up to the campsite. And it's me, my wife, my father, my three kids, and three other kids that was with them. Now, we camp in a tent, but our tent is nice. You know, it's humongous. We had two other tents with us, so we had plenty of room. When we set up the campsite, if you're sitting in a car and you're behind the driver's seat, behind the steering wheel, and you look forward, the campsite goes as follows. Where the passenger side front tire would be is your water, your electricity, and the tree line there. It goes back deep, about 30 foot. It goes over towards your driver's side about 25 foot, and then back out. So it's more or less a dead-end little area. We set our big tent up to the driver's side of that campsite, so we're staring off into the woods. We set up our tents, everything set up. The uh, picnic table is sitting beside a fire pit, I guess, where, you know, you burn or whatever. And uh, what we have, we have what we call like a picnic tent or a table tent. It's a little screen area we set over a picnic table to keep the bugs off the dinner and the kids eating. Well, when I set it up over the picnic table, I looked down and the fire pit was like two foot from it. So I told my wife, I said, look, I'm going to move the fire pit or we're going to burn our tent down. Kind of laughed and I picked it up. I walked over toward the tree line and I set it down, and when I looked back up, there was a game trail going straight down through the woods. Now, it went about 40 feet deep, and then you couldn't really tell which way it went. But I told my wife, I said, wow, check that out. That's a game trail, man. A lot of animals must come through here. And that was about it of that. So we set up our campsite, and the day goes on. We go back down to the lake once or twice, not anything spectacular happening there a little swimming or whatever we come back up and the kids shoes are wet so we take all of our shoes off and we set them along the i guess the edge of the campsite close to the fire pit we cook dinner and the kids are playing and we're talking about boogers and you know night animals and 
I take a little bit of the dinner and I'm kind of flicking it over the edge of the campsite out in the bushes, hoping to see a fox or a possum or something come up and eat it, just thinking that it'll be cool for the kids to see. So that goes on and it starts getting into the evening time and we uh chill out. The kids are chilling out, roast marshmallows, talking, playing. Sure enough, here comes a little possum and here comes a fox. I mean, it's just that little area was packed with animals eating, and uh, the kids got to enjoy it. Kind of got spooked a little bit, but I assured them it would be okay. And they went in and lay down. Now it's about nine thirty, ten o'clock, to be honest with you. It's dark, and they lay down, and they're they're scared. I have to go in and tell them, it's going to be okay. You know, Daddy's out here. Papa's out here. Mom's out here. And there's nothing to worry about. When we have that many kids, we always bring, like, a little portable DVD player or something for them to watch and they didn't watch it five seconds and they were out like a light so we unplugged it tense black we're sitting by the fire talking by this time a couple of hours have passed and it got real quiet you know now we have a, a umbrella set up basically a piece of pvc pipe tapped in the ground and the umbrella is stuck in the pvc pipe now if it did rain, we would take everything that couldn't get wet, like a little AM, FM radio or food, bread, you know, anything that we didn't want to get wet that wasn't packed up and just set it underneath the umbrella. Well, upon unpacking and getting ready, the umbrella was in the ground, and we had took, you know, the best way I can describe it is a big variety bag of potato chips. It comes with 24 packs of potato chips in small bags, but they're big, you know. We had like five of those stacked up over there, some bags, some store bags, you know, under the umbrella, which will come into play shortly. We've got the fire going, and it's honestly blazing. I had it jacked up pretty well. We turn on the radio. We're scanning through the channels. We're not getting good signal. And uh anyway, my dad gets a phone call. Now, it is really, really late at night. Now, it's probably one thirty, two o'clock in the morning. And he answers it, of course, and it's my brother. He was laughing. He's like, hey, you guys having a good time? My dad's like, yeah, you scared me. Is everything okay? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just calling check on you guys, you know. Anyway, in the meantime, my dad having a phone call and being occupied with his phone, he's got an old flip phone, you know. So he flips it down, and about that time, Behind the fire pit in the pitch black dark, I'm talking all you could see was the fire and what it illuminated. A body appears. And when I say a body, it started about two inches from the ground and stood up slowly. And it stood up slowly to the point where it was standing on two legs. Now, if I can describe this, it was as if it was laying on its belly stood up, and immediately when it stood up, it had turned to its right. Now, what I think had happened is I think that game trail, this particular area has the highest elevation almost in Florida. That's one of the things that gets you there. It's full of sinkholes and several places that animals could hide. Now, it is extremely creepy. If you Google it like I did after I left, and I will do before I go anywhere else again, it's packed with paranormal. I mean, everything from hooded ghosts to women that stand by the lake at night. I mean, it's just packed to the gills with stuff that'll give you the hibby-jibbies without even mentioning what I saw. So anyway, back to what I saw. This black creature, I'm going to say a dog man because I feel wholeheartedly that's what it was, comes up the game trail. Now, if I'm standing at the top of the game trail where the fire pit was, and I looked out into the game trail, it drops down about 40 foot right there and levels out, and that goes down to the lake. What I'm thinking happened is the fire was blazing. My head, my wife's head, and my father's head was about the only thing that you could see from being down that low. I don't think you can see the fire. I just think you can see our heads lit up, our bodies, the top of our heads, and maybe the top of our tent. And I think that it crawled on its belly up that embankment, up that gang trail, intending on eating dinner. 
And I believe this with 100% everything in me. Well, once it gets to the top of this embankment, the gang trail to the campsite area, the fire pit is within inches of the gang trail. It's right on the edge of the place. There's no trees to catch on fire because it goes straight downhill. First, I see the head, the pointy ears, of course. I lean back in my chair. The way that I'm sitting, it would be me, my wife, or I'm sorry, it would be my wife, my father, and me sitting on the back side of this fire pit. Directly straight in front of me, I'm in the middle, is the center of the gang trail where, they, where it happened. So this dog man crawls up on its belly, creeps up, and I honestly think it burned its face on the fire. Maybe the back draft of the fire or the, or the wind blew it. But it stands up, and when it stands up, it immediately turns and throws its shoulder and arm in front of its face. Okay? It's not hiding from me, but I honestly think that it burned its face when it tried to creep up and attack us. So it turns its body. When it shifts its body, I see a tail. I see a arm over a face, over a hairy head, a dog head, a wolf head. The ears are pinned straight back. I can see the nose. It shifts its lower half. And at this point, I'm not even thinking anything about shoot it, run, nothing. I mean, there was what was going through my mind, nothing was going through my mind. What is this is going through my mind. And my wife spit it out before I could. And I'm reaching over with my arm trying to slap my dad, and he's just closed his phone. He's not even paying any attention to it. He sees it when it takes off. Now, it takes off, and when it takes off, it takes one step. The dirt flies up, just to tell you the weight of this thing, runs around the umbrella, packed full of bags and, and plastic, you know, and anything that steps, if a mouse stepped on a plastic bag, it's going to make some noise. This thing was agile, and I say so agile that it literally dodged everything that was there and disappeared, buddy. I turned the spotlight on, and it was gone. So fast that I shined the trees above me. I shined the trees in the distance. I shined everywhere I could shine. My dad's freaking out. My wife's about to have a panic attack. I'm about to have a panic attack, but, you know, I'm a man. But, yeah, right, I wasn't at that point. You know, I'm not afraid to admit it. I was freaking. <laughs> you know, this stuff isn't supposed to be real. And if it is... What the world? It, it disappeared so fast that at this point, I've got a 20-yard view of everywhere around our campsite. And it is all literally in the forest. But still, I can see a good distance. There was no sign of it to the point that I'm shining these big oak trees over my head because I'm thinking wherever it went, it went fast and it's hiding. There's no way it ran that fast unless it's Superman. So I'm hunting and looking, you know, and and I never laid eyes on it again, ever, never seen it. Now, the description of it was about eight foot tall, a head about the size of a, a beach ball, I guess you would say, massive. The ears that I've seen, I didn't get a description of how long they were because they were pinned back beside its head like it was mad, and it had good reason to be. His back was hunched over. His tail, uh, his tail was not fuzzy and furry. It, it wasn't like a, like a, I guess you would say like a chow or a canine, a, a, a German shepherd tail with, with long fur. It was black, but it was a tail, like you would say, uh, I don't know, uh, a short haired dog. The color of this thing was absolutely as black as black could be. It was blacker than night in the forest, uh, darker than behind it. Um, I seen claws on its hands. Its hands were approximately, uh, eight and a half to ten inches. Just the fingers and hand that I saw. And when I say I saw its hand, when it put its shoulder over its face, if you threw your left shoulder over your face and tried to hide your face, your palm is going to be facing outward, okay? I seen its palm and its fingers and claws. I didn't get a good description because all this happened in a few seconds. 
But, uh, you know, the last I checked, a bear couldn't turn its wrist. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm racking my brain on anything that this could be. I wanted it to be a Bigfoot after what I saw. You know, I had wanted it to be something that I was familiar with because I wasn't familiar with a dog man. And the intentions that this thing had, honestly, I think, was to come up and take every one of our heads off. And I thank God that I had moved that fire pit where I did and uh, did what I had did. So uh, the next morning, we wake up, the kids wake up, and I have to tell them, you know, I, I, I went, you know, through drastic measures to try to figure out why this thing had come this way, other than that's just its trail, that's its roadway, and we were in between its path. And like I say, I do think that it's seen us down that hill, and he said, mm, dinner takes off up the hill creeping, you know, just like anything else would in hunter mode and popped up and the rest I kind of described to you. The next morning we woke up, I had to tell the kids I didn't want them to go. I didn't want to terrify them and ruin their time, but I had to explain to them, look, I seen something and it was bad. You know, I, I seen something and it would hurt you. When we go to the bathroom, we go in a group. When we go anywhere, we go in a group. At night, when the sun goes down, we don't go anywhere. I explained to them that I had seen something. I didn't get in real detail because I didn't want to terrify them beyond belief. But uh put it this way, uh, there was a 33-year-old man and his father taking fishing line and running it around the campsite just the, the shape of the campsite about 10 foot back in the bushes and taking every soda can that we had had and filling them up with rocks and tying them close together. That way, if something come and tripped that line, at least we would hear something. The following night, it did get tripped. We did hear it. And I'm laying in my tent. I hollered my dad, did you hear that? He's like, yeah, stay in your tent. I'll check on it. Of course, I got out with my big machete and looked, but, uh, there was nothing that I could have done, I don't think. And my theory has always been, if it breathes, it bleeds. If it moves, and I still think that it can be taken down just as well as anything else. But that was the last thing on my mind, Vic, when I had seen it. The last thing on my wife's mind, it, it was terrifying. It was a terrifying experience. That's why I had mentioned, you know, anyone that has seen something like this, it's hard to tell their story. For one, you, my hands are sweaty right now as I'm speaking to you about it. It's a scary topic. Even if we were just telling ghost stories, the people I've told about it, I've told so many people, Vic, that when I go to tell them a story, as we're talking, they say, oh, I know about the thing that walked up on you. I don't know what I would have done because it, I don't lie. You know, I'm going to tell it like it is, whether you like it or not. But uh, until you vividly see what I've seen, there's no way that I can describe it in words instead of saying on legs, basically. It sure sounds like it to me. I'm not judging you, but after having such a nightmarish experience, why didn't you leave, especially since you had your kids with you? Well, the thing was, I went up to the park rangers thinking that I was going to get some sort of relief. But instead, the first word out of the park ranger's mouth, and I had not said a word. I was debating on even saying anything to him, but I'm trying to build up the courage or start a topic. This guy leans in the window and says, Hey, man, uh, do you believe in Black Panthers? I said, Yeah. Thought it was a weird thing to say. He said, uh, Man, I was driving around the, the perimeter, man, and I think I seen a Black Panther leaning up against a tree. And I was thinking, leaning up against the tree, Panthers don't stand up. But I didn't say anything. I was like, wow, that's crazy, you know. And I went on about my business. And I told my dad, me and my dad looked at each other like we both just seen a ghost. And anyway, we had went back. But we had reserved these campsites. And it wasn't just us staying there. We were we were here. We had other family there and campers. And it was more or less a once-in-a-year thing. And... I had felt like, after discussing it with my family, we were leaving. There was no doubt about it. But after discussing it with my family, we were in his way. That was his domain. So anyway, as the story goes on, we had heard in the woods prior to this happening, and I'm sorry that it left it out, but we had 
heard something walking in the woods. And when I say walking in the woods, it didn't care that it was heard. It was breaking trees out of its way. It was it was beating a path, as we would say. And the sound that it made was unlike any sound that I had ever heard before. And I've heard everything from bear to deer yelling. I mean, if you can believe it, to rabbit scream. I've heard it all. This thing was making a noise, Dick, and the closest that I could come to it was, I mean, and it was screaming it. It wasn't just making a noise. It was like a uh, noise. It, I don't know that it was a growl. At that point, I didn't think it was a growl, but it made this noise about 20 yards to my right, then right in front of me, and then about 20 yards to my left. And then it starts walking down, and you can hear this noise getting away from you. And almost like saying, Hey, buddy, I'm out here. This is where I'm at. Come and get me or get out of my way and leave me alone. You know, we were in his domain. Anyway, needless to say, the following day, we changed campsites to a walk-up site, which is completely on the other side of the park from that area. But that was, everything was calm from there. I mean, we didn't hear anything but cars passing every five minutes. It's a totally different experience over there because you're not out in the wilderness, but Nobody cared. Everybody was kind of glad. Well, I can understand that. When that encounter happened, you said other people had been camping there. Were there any other families or campers close enough where they could have seen it too? Oh, I'm sure. The girl that camped beside us, we've went there before. Now, before we went there, we just assumed it was bears, honestly. And there was a girl that was camping in a camp beside us. We were camping anyway and, and walking down to the lake and enjoying it. And I was just amazed that this young girl, she was probably 19 years old, was over there all alone. And uh we never seen another car pull up. She had just a small pop-up tent. And through the night, you know, I'm telling my wife, you know, should we go tell her that we hear things in the woods? And this was before our encounter that I just discussed. And I went over and broke the ice. I was like, sorry, man, I'm sorry to bother you, you know. And she's sitting in her tent. She had a claw hammer in her tent. Now, her tent is set against the woods. It's not where I would set my tent if I was camping alone. And now I would camp alone. But anyway, she had came over. She ended up eating dinner and listening to us. And when she went back to her campsite, she actually camped behind our tent. She didn't even go back to her campsite. But anyway, from where we were at, there's campers that pull in right there where we had our experience at. And out of all the campers in the campsite, when it gets dark, for some reason, every light in that campsite is out. I don't know if they could turn it out because it's a game trail and it's heavy traffic for animals to come through and maybe the lights distract them and make them bother the campers or what. But throughout the campsite, it almost looks like Christmas with all the campers lit up, except for that one particular site. Everybody that camps there has their lights out, I guess. Maybe it prevents things from coming toward them. I don't know. I have no idea about it, but uh, I can't speak for anybody else because I haven't seen anybody else but that one girl in a tent. Everybody else is in a camper that has a little bit of support between them. Yeah, it does make you wonder what that's all about. Maybe they do know something. It's hard to say. How good of a look did you get at its face before it put its arm up to block the heat from the fire? I want to say that I got a great look. But I didn't, Vic. I was more or less, as soon as I seen a shape, and I my eyes comprehended that it was a shape of a thing, I looked over at my wife. And in the split second that I looked over at my wife, it had already stood up. So I don't know if at that point I was looking straight down at the top of its head while it was crawling on its belly or what. But I want to say that the split second that I did see its eyes, they were yellow. They were glowing yellow. And now he turned completely away from me. I did get a good look at the side of its body and its tail and the back of its head, but that was about it, hands and arms. But I didn't get a good description of the face. I wish I would have, but I'm also glad I didn't. Well, I don't blame you there. Were you able to see if its mouth was open? I could not tell. I'm willing to say that it wasn't because it was just its shoulder and arm blocking its face, which would be more of your bicep area. I seen the end of its nose, and I feel like if his mouth was open, I would have seen the bottom of his teeth, but I did not. 
Oh, that's okay. I don't fault you for not noticing that. I mean, you had other things on your mind, like <laughs> trying not to have a Charmin moment or something. Yes, sir. And, and man, I'll keep that between me if I did or not. But <laughs> Oh, of course. Yeah, what a man does in his pants is nobody's business but his. So I don't blame you there. Terrifying, man. I'm not too big of a man to say that I was terrified. And, you know, I, I've always had this thing about me to where I like to, to help people out. I always like to be the hero, you know, as well as everybody else. But at this moment, I felt like the opposite of a hero. I felt just as helpless as, as anybody else could be. Yeah, well, there wasn't much you could do in that situation but just sit there and watch. Thank goodness it didn't get any worse than it was. Thank goodness the dog man just left you. Yeah, I'm glad we had the fire built. I'm glad I moved it there. I'm glad all the little small things took in place to where I had it where it was because I honestly think that if it did not get put there, we would have been just the casualties of a wild animal attack. They maybe would have chalked it up to a bear or a panther or, or something. But uh, really what cemented it for me was whenever the park ranger had said what he had said and he was terrified when he said it and i did not say a word man and i mean if you can feel out you know it's kind of weird hearing it but if you can think about how i felt when he said that i was like well now i know something's out here <laughs> you know i've seen it but now i know someone else has seen it It'll never happen, but it would be nice to know how much that park ranger knows about that area and all the strange things that have gone on there. He's since quit, Vic. He doesn't work there anymore. I asked for him the last time we had went. We went there for a birthday party because they had several different areas of this park, and one of them is a playground pavilion area. And it costs admission to get in, and then, you know, you camp in separate. And I asked to speak with him just to have a conversation, you know, to catch up and honestly to see if he had heard anything or seen anything else. And they said he didn't work here anymore, which struck me odd, but I can't say I blame him. Well, I don't blame him either. How did your kids respond when you sat them down and told them about what had happened? Well, it kind of reversed everything I had ever told them. I mean, I don't know how to describe it. Daddy was a liar, you know. I'm telling them, you don't have to worry about Bigfoot. I said, has Bigfoot ever been seen? Have you ever seen Bigfoot? You know, just the typical monster under the bed, you know. Uh, don't worry about it. It's never been seen. And then me physically seeing it and then having to tell them, okay, look, you remember when Daddy said that you didn't have to worry? I didn't tell them to completely let their guard down because we're in the wilderness. A lot of things can happen. I've seen some crazy stuff. but. To tell them that, see the fear in their face, it broke my heart, to be honest with you. You know, it really did. And, and honestly, the hardest part was telling my kids. After I told my kids, I could have told the president. But telling my kids what I had saw and that I felt like I had no control over it, that I was worried, that was that was hard. They they took it good. I mean, they took it as well as they could anything. But there's not a time that Campins mentioned that they mentioned, we're not going there, are we? And I say, no. <laughs> Have you done anything special to help those kids deal with that experience? Yeah, we've uh, watched documentaries. I've talked to them about it. You know, I've talked to them about cases and stuff that may or may not be true. I tell them to keep an open mind because, you know, if they see something, they want people to believe them. So when somebody tells you something, take it to heart. Don't just take it with a grain of salt and act like it never happened. My kids are very smart, man. They're very considerate. They have big hearts. So my kids are going to be great when it comes to being older and taking their kids out in the wilderness also. You know, I don't want to stop anybody from going out in the woods, and I don't want my story to be, this may sound weird, but I would rather somebody say, oh, he's a liar and not believe a word I said than say, I'm going to stay away from the woods now because of this. Because, man, it could have happened to anybody. I'm still breathing. I'm glad that we have a place like this to come talk about our encounters to where people want to listen, you know. And when I listen to your episodes, man, I'm glued to it. I mean, I'm waiting for every word and every pause and for you to have to pause it because they have to gather their thoughts because it is terrifying. But wilderness is beautiful. I want everybody to enjoy it, but I want everybody to also know that there's just like anything, you know, there's a risk involved. Where are you at now in your attempt to recover from that experience? Are you in a good place, or 
Do you still struggle with it quite a bit? Well, it took a while. Even when we moved campsites, we never went back down to the lake. The place is absolutely beautiful, man. I mean, it is gorgeous. It has a huge lake, and they welcome you to go down there when the sun goes down to look at the stars. We went once, and this is before the encounter. It was terrifying. I mean, there's bats swooping around your face, and nobody goes down there. Not a soul goes down there at night to enjoy the stars. The only traffic is there in the daytime. I can't tell you what people see, but that's for them to tell. But I've adjusted well. I mean, I've now got a camper that we go camping in that has a locked door, thick windows. You know, you have to respect it. If you're if you're working in a zoo and you go feed lions, you're not going to walk in a lion's den with a plate of steaks and say, here, come eat. You're going to ease it through the bars and, and let them have a bite, you know, probably with some kind of tool that hands it to them. So when you're in the wilderness, you're not going to just go out there like a T-bone steak ready to be eaten. You just need to prepare is all. You know, keep your food locked up. Keep yourself locked up if you can. Keep yourself away from danger and enjoy it. Well, I'm glad to hear that it sounds like you've recovered really well from that. Of course, you're not totally back to normal yet, but it'll take time before you get to that point. Most definitely. What are your wife's thoughts on what happened that night? She was so distraught about it. When I talk about it, she don't say anything, but yep, yep. You know, I mean, when I tell people about it, she just, she knows it happened. She knows it was terrifying. And and I can't get in her head to say how she feels, but she'll throw in details that maybe I forgot about it. Just different small things. Like, for instance, we did bring two small dogs with us, two small chihuahuas. They're my kids' dogs. They're small. They're teacup chihuahuas. And this was before the encounter also, and uh, they refused to go out of the tent. I mean, we would let them out of the tent, and they would cry and, and scream like something was after them to get back in the tent. They would relieve themselves in the tent. And I was like, all right, after this, we're not bringing them anymore. You know, we're going to have to get a, a sitter for them because they, they can't just sit in the tent all day. Most dogs, you know, you would think when you go camping, they want to go with you. They wanted to stay in the tent secure. My wife had mentioned that. I'm sorry that I had forgot to mention it, but she helps me remember the small things, but it's burnt in her mind as well. She has an occupation where she works at night, and she has seen things. She's a paper delivery person, and she works at night, so she goes to work about 2.30 or 3 in the morning. And she has seen everything from panthers to what she would say is coyotes or whatever. She's never seen anything like that. I mean, it completely blew her mind like I would expect it would for anybody. If it didn't, then something's wrong with you. Oh, I'd say so. Yeah, I spoke with your wife the other night, and sounds like she's handling it really well. Yeah, she's, she's doing the best she can. Above all, we have to be parents, and we have to be strong. And it might be silly to some people to say, get over it, but until you see it, and until you experience it, Just hold that thought, because when you do, it'll come to you. You'll feel what everybody that's been on this show has felt. Yeah, getting over it, that's a lot easier said than done. For someone who's never experienced anything like this, yeah, they've got no way to know what it's like. Did you ever smell anything strange when that dogman crept up on you? Well, I would like to say that I did, but what was strange about it is the possums and fox and everything that was there disappeared. Now, I didn't notice this until after it had came and after we had experienced it, because I stayed up until daylight. I didn't even go to sleep. Me and my father was like soldiers. I mean, we were keeping guard. But, no, I can't say that I smelled anything. It was raining, so the scents are going to be low to the ground. They're going to be going, but if it was coming from a lower elevation, the scent is going to stay back that direction. So I think the factors of the rain and the dew and the mist had everything to do with it. I see. That makes sense. How many people have you told about your encounter? I've told a a lot of people. I've told a lot of people that wanted to go camping with us, not to terrify them, but to explain to them that it was real. Everybody that I've told it to, because of my expression maybe, and who I am, they believe it. And they look at me with terrified eyes from the story. I've never had anybody laugh or or not believe me, but I've told several people, a lot of people, as a matter of fact. 
Wow. Well, I'm glad to hear you got such positive responses when you did share that story with people. Yeah, it breaks my heart, really, whenever people come on and tell their loved ones or their husband or wife or mother or father their story and they get eyes rolled or whatever because, man, it's terrifying. I mean, I don't want to compare it to anything because it's hard to do that, but it's almost like, I don't know, somebody popping up in your window and scaring you, that feeling you feel for just a second, that feeling lasts for a while. And for people not to believe you and not to accept that, that's exactly why I said go get your app, Dog Man Encounters, download it, pay you two ninety nine a month, and it's almost like a counseling for you. It's it's something words can't describe. It's entertainment, it's counseling, it's people that have the same experience as you. I mean, I could just go on, but yeah, that's why I had mentioned it. Well, I appreciate you doing that. And it is frustrating when you hear about an eyewitness who tells their spouse, for example, about their encounter and they wind up getting the cold shoulder or getting laughed at. Yeah, that's so frustrating. I can't even imagine what that must be like. Yeah, it's got to be bad, man. I mean, I'm blessed. I think I told you in the pre-interview that I'm blessed to have a wife as, as good as I have and my children. You know, I'm grateful for everything I have and everything I don't have. When you see something like that, it's almost like the boogeyman. It puts stuff into perspective. You know, you're not the alpha. <laughs> and, uh, you know, every man likes to be the alpha, even if he's just a protector. And at that time, I felt like anything but that. And I'm not too big of a man to admit it, and I could care less what people think. But going back again, man, it's just one of those things until you have an experience. I can go on for days and talk for hours and, you know, have listeners either rolling their eyes or saying, wow, he's got a point. But until you physically experience it, and, you know, some of the episodes you share, man, a couple of them come to mind, but some of the episodes you share that you're trying to <clears throat> open car doors and uh scratches on them, I mean, chasing them. I don't know. You know, I don't know if the fire wouldn't have been there. I don't think I would be here. I, I can say that I know that I wouldn't be here. There's nothing that I can say to Google and say, hey, would I survive this? But from what I've seen, there's no amount of weaponry that you're going to grab in that fast. And this thing snuck up, crept up, climbed up on its belly, and stood up to attack and eat. It didn't do it just to walk a trail. Now, maybe it was headed down the trail and seen us, but I don't know. It's just a terrifying experience, man. It's beyond words, I guess you could say. Yeah, something like that is hard to describe. And I don't know, Casey, if that dog man really did have killing you on its mind, I think that's what would have happened that night, whether you saw it or not. If it really wanted you, I think it would have circled around eventually at some point since you stayed there and taken you out. It didn't do that, so in my opinion, it showed you what it had on its mind. Yeah, it, it could have very well, Vic. It could have been walking its path, but I went down that hill the next day and looked up, and I had my wife and dad sit in the chairs, and all I could see was their heads. And the way that it crawled up the hill, I tried to sneak up the hill without them seeing me in the daylight. I couldn't do it without being heard, for one, from the limbs and stuff. And for two, when I did do it, basically I was laying on my belly. And when I popped up and turned the same direction that it turned, and ran the same direction it ran. There's, it, it, it's almost like it disappeared. You know, there's several places it could have went. That place is slap full of sinkholes that have sent chills down your spine. I mean, it's it's a very creepy place. But after that had happened, this campsite was lit up like the Fourth of July. I had every single light that you can have on on from the tents to the headlights of the vehicles to the cars crunk up. I didn't care who heard me. I literally went and got the keys to the cars and was ready to push the alarm on the button if something was happening. I mean, if it wanted to come get me, it would have had to come to a area that was lit up beyond any other campsite there. I would be willing to say it was lit up brighter than daylight after that. Well, I don't blame you for lighting things up like that, but I don't think you can ignore the fact that for you to stay there after seeing something like that, it takes a lot of sand. It takes a lot of guts to do that. 
Yeah, I didn't think of it that way. I thought that if I left, I ruined my kids an experience of a lifetime. You know, we go camping, we get to do it. It may be normal to some people, but my children don't get to experience it much. And with school and everyday life, man, life's just too short. Life's too busy. I think everybody can relate to that. So with that being said, I wanted everybody to enjoy the trip. And if that meant me being Rambo for a day, then that's what it took. And, you know, I'm not saying that I'm the reason why it didn't come here because I don't think that. But I'm glad I did stay and I'm glad my kids got to enjoy it instead of coming home and saying we left because we were terrified. Because at that point, you wouldn't go back. I don't think we would ever want to go back anywhere. Well, I am glad at least it turned out in a positive way and you didn't let it ruin your fun. This isn't a comfortable thought, but when you think back on that experience that you had that night, do you think another dog man might have been around? I do. I don't think there's one of them. I mean, it takes two to tango, you know what I mean? And uh, it's just unreal the way I had felt at the lake, the deer that I had seen. I didn't say anything about the deer to the park rangers because it's nature. Stuff like that's going to happen. If you're in a area that is a state park or a government area, the animals are protected, and they know this. They're going to flock there, man. It's just going to be a hotbed. And the more deer and food, the more predators. And I honestly think that there's more than just one there. I believe there's several there. And I believe that if you're looking for them, it wouldn't be hard to find them. I'm not saying that I recommend anybody go look for them, but I was not looking for them. I was not ready to experience what I experienced, and it happened without looking. So, yeah, I think there's a there's more than one there. If I had to say, I'd say there was a group of them there. And maybe the one I seen wasn't the biggest or the smallest, but it was big enough for me to freak out over. Oh, I'd say it was. And as far as looking for them goes, in a lot of cases, these things will come looking for you. Yeah. I threw the bits of hot dogs out and stuff, man, and we had flocks of, I mean, it's hard to describe, but I mean, I even took pictures of, at one point, like five possums. And then after the possums would leave, the foxes would come and rabbits would actually hop by on the other side. I mean, it was amazing the wildlife that was coming to pick up the little scraps. And all of that disappeared. And I was going down there every 15 minutes or so, just shining the light over there. And, and there was no animals. I was like, well, they must be bedding down. You know, it might be going to rain. But I think that it was because the dog man was coming and they knew it. You know, just like when I was fishing and the hair on the back of my neck stood up, I think that I knew it. You know, there's some things that you can't describe, and that's a couple of them. You said you still go camping, but do you still do other things in the woods, like hunting or fishing? And it's kind of sad, but we live somewhat in the country. We live in the country, but close enough to the city limits that we're still able to go to the stores or whatever relatively fast. But we have golf carts and four-wheelers, man, and we went from riding in the woods to me making a trail in the yard. I have about a 1,000 acres behind me of forest, and I'm not too sure about the kids being close to the back of the property, so they stay more or less to the front of the property. We have animals that are on the back of the property, but no, we don't go to the woods or do it as leisurely as we used to. We used to follow trails on the four-wheeler to see where they went. We used to go to little nooks and crannies back in the woods that nobody knew for a good little fishing holes. And I consider it living a good life, you know, get on a four-wheeler with a full tank of gas and go somewhere that only you and whoever's with you are at and possibly even know about, enjoy it, to uh, staying on the main roads and not doing it after dark. Yeah, it's going to be hard to have the same amount of fun as it used to. Yeah, even when it comes to camping now, now we go on the website, reserve our campsite. Before we even do that, we ride up and literally drive the site with our vehicle. Get out, touch it, look at it, smell it, and make sure that it is, it, it used to be the word kid friendly, but now we say family friendly, just to make sure that we have a great area before we even go, before we even reserve it. So we go on the website to reserve it, but 
we can easily pay when we're there because we go way before time and take a look at the area. Yeah, I'm not surprised you do reconnaissance like that now, now that you know they're out there. After you had your encounter, how much research did you put into dog men? I'll tell you, uh, I've went on probably every website that Google has to offer. I mean, I've Googled every documentary, and I've sat through some that was hours long, and in the last minute it was nothing, no evidence. And it kind of made me mad, you know, but it led me to you. And and honestly, I say that, it might sound funny, but I've read or, or watched everything from Cannibals in the Jungle documentary to Bigfoot to Dogman to Sasquatch. And when you click on it, the thumbnail may look amazing, but the material isn't. And when I found you, I believe I found you on another website or maybe another show, and you were talking about the different types of Dogman. And I was like, boom, there it is. That's what i seen, you know. Uh, you described the fingernails, the hands, the the, the black coat, and it, you took the words out of my mouth. And nobody has done that. Nobody has, has you know, described it to a team before. And that's why in the pre-interview, I want to describe it to you before you even had a chance to describe it to me. That way, you knew what it was about and could relate to what I had seen. But yeah, man, uh, hours, days even, late into the night. I own my own business and I'm blessed to do so, but I stayed up many nights trying to figure it out because it's, I mean, if you need to change your headlight in a car, you can't do it. You grab your phone, you Google it, you usually watch a YouTube video or a review on how to do so. Something simple as that. So if you see something and you want to know about it, you're going to Google and research and watch videos and try to find it. And it was nearly impossible, man. That's why I'm grateful to have you and 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 your listeners, man, because they make your show, you know. And I'm glad to be able to come on here. I was hesitant about doing so. I didn't really want to come on. I didn't really want to share my encounter. I'm nervous now. I'm sweating, a little clammy, but it doesn't matter. If I can relay my message and my view to anybody, to one person, that's good enough for me. And I'm grateful for you to let me do that. I'm glad you found out about Dogman Encounters. I'm glad you found the website. And speaking of the website, dogmanencounters.com, I just rolled out a new version of the website. If you go to dogmanencounters.com, you'll notice the new website there. It's got a lot more content. It's just a much better layout. I think you'll like it. What was funny, Vic, is I went on and downloaded your Dogman Encounters app to my Android phone before I even went to your website because I knew of your show. I knew of you knowing about dog men. So I downloaded the app. And on the app, I'm able to click on shows, listen to them commercial free. I'm able to pick and choose the shows. I love the greatest episodes, you know, the three or four shows together. It's it's awesome because it's just entertainment and enlightenment throughout three hours. I love every show, don't get me wrong. But I downloaded the app before I even become a member. So I'm trying to play them, and it was locked. So I went back over and found your Dogman Encounters page, clicked on it, put my credit card information on there for two ninety nine. I mean, if you can find anything for two ninety nine that is similar to counseling or entertainment as much as this is, I'd be glad to hear it. But anyway, I went on, found it, found the website, downloaded it, went back to the app, and the shows were ready, man. It, it's got it to where you can actually... See all the episodes that you've played. See how far that you've played into them. It saves it. It doesn't ever erase it. I mean, it's an awesome app, man. And I recommend it to everybody to get. Well, thanks for the good words again on the app. And I'm so glad the website's helped you. I'm so glad I've been able to help you. Yeah, it's hard, man. It's uh, it's kind of like walking down a one-way street and everybody's going backwards. You, you got something to say, but nobody wants to listen. And if they do want to listen, they know everything. They know what you saw you know they know what you experienced and it's just the opposite with you i mean i kind of explained my story and i think i did it in reverse and i apologize for that i apologize to the listeners if my story's a little bit backwards but you know when you have a i'd like to say a traumatizing experience to where something sticks in your memory so vividly that's the part that you want to tell so the little nuances and details that come in before and after that are Kind of an afterthought, and I apologize if I left anything out and said a few things after the fact, but 
I hope that I was able to come off as showing my experience and painting a pretty vivid picture of everything. Oh, no, you did a great job. Yeah, you changed the order a little bit in how you delivered the details and the facts of what happened with your experience, but the details you shared with me in the pre-interview are the details you shared tonight on the show, so they might have been delivered in a different order, but they haven't changed. Do you know anyone else who camps in that area now? No, I can't say I do. I know a few folks that will never go there. I say I know them, but I've shared my stories, and, and they've heard stuff not even seen it, and we'll never go there. I know a lot of people, some old-timers, have told me stories about the place, just not going into any detail. I don't want to say, really, tell me everything. You know, I just nod my head in agreement and, and go on about my business. But no, I can't say I know anybody that's going to camp there. I know people that will never camp there again, including me. Yeah, after an experience like that, how could you? Have you had problems with nightmares because of that experience? Yeah. Probably the first week was the worst. And it, I, I wouldn't say nightmares. I would go to sleep fine, just wake up. I, mean, I guess it would be considered a nightmare. I mean, I wake up fairly early, and it seemed like every night right before waking up, I would see it every night. And I'd wake up kind of gripping my sheets and gritting my teeth. And after about a week, it started to subside. And I think it's the mental part, and, and especially me trying to block it out, probably don't help me. So getting it out of my system is going to be the best thing for me, I honestly believe. Yeah, you're not going to get any better by suppressing it. Unless you deal with it head-on, you're not going to get better. So I'm glad you are coming out and talking about this and dealing with it. Speaking of which, just a bit ago, you said you didn't want to come on the show at one time. Why would you decide to come on the show and talk about this in a public venue? Well, I was listening to a few episodes, and... Some of the episodes were more gripping than others, and I could tell one particular episode you had to pause and let the person gather their thoughts because they were honestly terrified. And at that point, I knew that they had seen what I had seen. It may have been a different color, but the same thing. And it took all I can do to come on the show because I had told you in the pre-interview, I'm more about building things up and, and, and making things better. And me talking about this is almost like I'm talking bad about this area, and I'm not. I don't want anybody to not go in the wilderness because of it. I just, it was hard for me to come out and express it on a public platform. There's, I'm assuming a lot of people that's going to listen to it. I'm a nervous guy. I'm a shy guy. But I kept telling myself that people need to hear it. Whether they believe it or not, that's up to them. But they just need to hear it and know what's out there, know what to expect to encounter Maybe how to handle it, I don't know. You know, if the trick is putting a fire in front of a game trail, <laughs> by all means, take off. You know, it's just, if you can get anything out of my story, I, I'm grateful for that. And getting it out of my system from suppressing it. I mean, I may have told people, but to be able to tell a platform is a lot different. Oh, there's no doubt about that. I've got no doubts you're going to be a lot better off now that you did decide to come on the show and talk about it. Yeah, I feel like uh, already a weight's been lifted off of me. Like I say, I'm a little bit sweaty. It's kind of reliving it, man. And it's not a bad thing, I guess, but yeah, it's a little nerve-wracking. But I, like I say, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't. Oh, it's not easy talking about an experience like the one you had, but it is beneficial to do that. So like I said, I'm so glad that you're doing this. Having said that, Casey, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? I would just like everybody to be on their toes. You know, even if you go to an area in the middle of nowhere picnic and just know that there's things out there. I mean, it wasn't long ago, honestly, you may laugh that the panda was a mythical creature. And a panda doesn't move anywhere. They actually found one. This was less, what, 50 years ago that they found the panda. So... There's things out there that do move and are harder to find. And just because you don't know about them doesn't mean they don't exist. And if you don't believe what I say, that's fine too. But I just say to err on the side of caution. When you're out in the wilderness, just be aware of your surroundings. Be aware that things are out there and anything could happen. Especially if you have kids, just be the protector that you were meant to be. And that's about it. Well, that's well said, Casey. Thanks again so much for coming on the show and telling us about your experience. I really do appreciate it. 
Thank you, Vic. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the listeners. And uh, like I say, I recommend downloading the app and listening to the show. It's great. For me, it's great counseling. It's it's comforting, you know. So uh, thank you for having me, Vic. Well, you know, I wish you nothing but the best. Have a great night. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.